All right. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 23. We, we stopped last week with uh, verse number uh, 13, I guess it was. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we want to get back into it again. When you get into this part of the book of Exodus, they're at Mount Sinai. Uh, God is giving them the law. Chapter number 20, you've got moral law. That's inward. That's what we do in our hearts, all right? That's who we are. By the way, what's in your heart is who you are. As a man uh, thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what we've got on the inside needs to be controlled. Listen, you're never going to get the outside right in your relationship with people until you get the inside right in your relationship to God. So you've got the moral law. Now we've been dealing with what's called civil law. We're going to finish that up. Civil law is outward. As the moral law is inward, civil law is outward. And how your moral compass is will dictate how you get along with everybody else. All right? We live in days of lawbreakers. All right? If you go to 2 uh, Timothy chapter number 3, he talked about the perilous times in which we live. And uh, he, one of the things he mentioned was disobedient parents. Kids that are disobedient to mom and dad. You say, why? Because they don't whoop them, all right? You got to spank children. I'm not talking about abuse. Now listen, if you don't control the child, eventually they'll control you. They'll do what they want, when they want, how they want. They won't care what you say, and, and you get into trouble. So what happens, the inside has to control the outside, how we interact. Now, in the days to come, boy, when you get to verse number 24, we're going to start into what's called ceremonial law. I'm excited about getting there because he's going to establish how do we meet with God when he set law. Now, it was all right before. Listen, they had spoken law. They had inward law. They had all these things. Now, all of a sudden, he's given moral law. He's given our law one with the other. So he set law, and God's the righteous judge. So you've got to be careful how you approach the bench, so to speak. So what he's going to set up is what's called ceremonial law. Now, this is going to be Old Testament. But when we get into verse, chapter number 24, we're going to start into the tabernacle. We're going to be there a pretty good while, folks. I'm going to start putting slides up here to give you a visual of what we're talking about. You know, you read and sometimes you don't get that visual image. Now, these images are going to be man-made. And they're not going to be of the actual tabernacle, but we're going to break that tabernacle down piece by piece by piece, our approach to God. In the Old Testament, they approached God through a priesthood. What's a priest? He represents man to God. He's your, your, your mediator. He's your go-between. That's who he is. Now, the ceremonial law is not in our day, but these things we're going to apply to Christ Christ fulfilled that law. He didn't fulfill the moral law because we still have that. He didn't fulfill the judicial law because we've got that. But now our approach to God, He's got law set and how we have to approach God. Listen, even today you can't just come to God any way you want to. You say, well, I'm an individual priest. I can pray. You have to go through Jesus Christ. If you noticed in all the movies and things when all these nice people pray at the table, they never mention the name of Jesus Christ. You ever notice that? I always pray through Christ because He's our advocate. He's our mediator. He's our high priest. And so we come to God through Jesus Christ. I hear a lot of people, they just they don't mention the name of Christ when they pray, and I always mention the name of Christ when I pray because that's our go-between. Now, when you get down here, notice what he said in verse number uh, uh, 13. He's been dealing with six days you'll work. Verse 13 of chapter 23 said, In all things that I have said unto you be circumspect. What is circumspect? It means that you carefully move or you carefully walk. I think of circumspect as a cat walking on the top of a picket fence with a bulldog on each side of the fence. He's walking very circumspect on, on that. He's on the top of that thing. All right, circumspect. Circum means surrounded. 
So we're in a circle and the laws around us and we have to be obedient to the word of God, the spirit of God that God's given us. Uh, we live in days of disobedience. But he said, I've said unto you, you be circumspect. Now, look in verse number 13, and make no mention of the name of other gods, and neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. We're not to speak of a lot of things. We're not to speak of those things that are done in darkness. Uh, there was a time when, the, listen, evil's always been around since the Garden of Eden. But I remember when I was a boy, there are certain things you just didn't talk about. There are certain things I didn't really know about until I became a grown man and, and uh, up in uh, college and then you military and all this type stuff. Uh, a lot of things were just not mentioned when we were kids. He said, you're not to even mention the name of these gods. Why? Because sometimes to our young people, when you tell them no to something, that becomes something of interest to them. Ah, they get it real interested. Don't you do this or touch that. If, if you tell a child you've got a hundred things in your living room, but you say, now, I, don't you touch that. That becomes a point of interest to the child. One, it's forbidden fruit. You know how that works out, all right? Now, they may not touch anything else in the room, but uh, you're going to see the little hands start heading in that direction. So what he said was, don't even mention these gods. Don't even tell your children that there are other gods. Don't mention it. Don't play with it. Don't let it be heard in your mouth. Why? Because God wants our mind to be stayed upon Him. That's what he said over in Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because He trusteth in thee. So he wants our mind solitary, all right? Not out here thinking about all the things of the world. Hey, we live in that day. Evolution, it's all around us. Millions of years, dinosaurs. Now they found out that uh, humans walked on this earth 90, 92, 93 million years ago. Listen, folks, they throw these numbers out here. They weren't there. You say, well, they carbon date and all this. Did you know when you get past 2500 B.C., they can no longer accurately carbon date anything because it kind of goes into a fog about that area, all right? So you were affected all the way around. He said you walk circumspect and make no mention of anything else. Circumspect means you just line up with what we've given you about God. Let, let that be all that the family sees. Now he begins to deal with the feast days again. We're not going to get all, into all of them. He's going to deal with three of them in, a, in our text today. Three times a year thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. There were three times when he established Israel. Now this is preemptively, okay? They've got seven feast days, actually. But three of these he's going to establish that once they get into the land, then you're going to have Jewish proselytes. And a Jewish proselyte is a Gentile that has come to know Jehovah God. They, 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 they are not Israelites in the flesh, but they are Israelites as far as, as their uh, worship goes. And, and so you're going to have an influx of people. Plus you're going to have Jews that are going to live in other countries. So he said three times a year, all of the males had to come to Jerusalem to worship. That's why later in the book of Kings, uh, you're going to have a problem between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Jeroboam was a heathen. And he was over the ten tribes, the north tribes of Israel and Rehoboam. They had to split kingdom. And Rehoboam was over what we call Judah, which is actually two tribes. So what happened was that Jeroboam was afraid that he was going to lose power because three times a year all of his men had to go to Jerusalem to worship. That's why they set up uh, idols in, in Dan and set them up, uh, I forgot the others, off the tip of my tongue right now, but they set up two idols so they could worship there. He said, Three times a year thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Look at verse 15. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. 
The unleavened bread took place between the 14th and the 21st day of Abib, or later they, they renamed that Nisan. Nisan or Abib is our month of April. So what we do is we have Easter Sunday, and I'd, I'd rather use the word Resurrection Sunday. Easter is found only one time in your King James Bible, and it's a reference to a Roman holiday. It was a heathen holiday. That's why you got all this heathen stuff coming in when we're supposed to be exalting the resurrection. Everything is on the world. It's, it's worldly minded. So what he said, the first one, Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you went back to chapter 12 of the book of Exodus, he told them, when you eat the Passover, you do not eat it with leaven. It was unleavened bread. You didn't eat it with leavened bread. So you've got Passover on the 14th of the month, which is the first day of unleavened bread, and it went to what we would call the 21st of the month. It was a seven-day feast. They had no leaven. Everything they ate in their house had no leaven. I've, if you've ever eaten unleavened bread, unleavened bread is virtually to me tasteless. I mean, we used to make unleavened bread uh, sometimes and just uh, sometimes by accident. Uh, that's when you got went to the store and got some self-rising flour, but they changed the bags before they changed the flour. And when you get home, you find out you got a bag of uh, unleavened flour, and then you've got to start putting the baking soda and everything with it to get things to rise. So they had what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread for 14 days. Now in verse 15, he said, As I commanded thee, that was back in Exodus chapter number 12, in the time appointed of the month, Abib, that was the 14th day of the month. For in it thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. They were to, they were to bring gifts and things at this particular time and offerings in. But this, this was because they came out of Egypt. You remember where they took the blood of the lamb, put it up the doorpost and the lintel of the top part of the door? And nobody went out at night, and in the morning they, they, made, they, they roasted the lamb that night. They had to eat every bit of it or destroy it and burn it with fire. By morning, no leavened bread was found with them, and when they came out, hey, they were already girded and clothes packed and ready to move. That's what he's talking about here. So we find one unleavened bread. The second feast is found in verse number 16. It's called the Feast of Harvest. Now when he's talking about harvest, he's not talking about the gathering at the end of the year. When you plant your uh, things in the springtime, you expect a harvest. It's an interesting thing in, in this Feast of Harvest. You know, a lot of people in, in the spring of the year, they plant uh, things too early. If you plant while the ground's still cold, it's not going to come up any faster than somebody that waited until it warmed up. You have to cover your plants. You've got frost and everything. Now, this particular feast, this feast of harvest, was 50 days after the Passover. So you're talking about a month and a half, almost two months afterward. They'd already had them in the ground now. They didn't wait that long. Hey. Best time to plant is mid to last part of April. You don't have to worry about frost, you know, grounds warming up. So 50 days later, they called that Pente Pentecost. We're used to that New Testament term. What is Pentecost? Pena, five, Pentecost. You're talking about 50 days after the Passover, they had Pentecost. When you get to Acts chapter number two, that's where they were in the upper room when the Spirit of God filled, all right, when he filled them in the fullness of his power, that was at Pentecost. That's why when they preached the word of God, after the Spirit of God came upon them with all of his power, that you hear 16 different languages that the word of God was preached in. And by the way, all 16 are mentioned in, Pen in, in the uh, Acts chapter number 2. None of it was this Ostel, Shandai, got a Yamaha, one a Honda, and all the Tinkerbell stuff. Hey, that's foolishness, folks. That's foolishness. There's no such thing as uh, this angelic tongue. When angels came, they spake in the, in the tongue of the people they came to. Wasn't that a blessing? 
If they came to Israelites, they spoke in Hebrew. When they appeared unto the Gentiles and Cornelius, they spake in the language that he understood. We call that your heart language. You may know five different languages, but one of them is what's called a heart language. We've got a lot of people today, Spanish. You can, you can uh, witness to these in English and they can understand, but if you can witness to them in Spanish, which is their heart language, friend, they, they've got ears to hear and hearts to listen at that point. So feast of unleavened bread and then feast of harvest. Notice he clarified it. The first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field. Now they've sown these in the field and now they're, what they're doing is they're praying over this stuff. I remember old John Watts. I used to go out with him. We'd plant stuff and he'd always get down on his knees and pray over the harvest. He prayed over the harvest when he put it in the ground. I've gotten down on my knees with him, helped him plant those good old winter onions uh, that he used to have and all these things. We'd get down on our knees and we'd pray over that. And that's what this was. This was at Pentecost in the New Testament. Now the third, notice the feast of the ingathering, which is in the end of the year. Now the end of the year, the ingathering was when they actually went into the fields and gathered it in. So three feasts a year. This was later called the Feast of Tabernacles. The reason being because they tabernacled in tents when they came into the land. They also called this the Feast of Tabernacles in the New Testament. If you notice three, three times. Now, what they had to do, look in verse 17. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Friend, they came in from uh, Europe. They came in from Asia, Asia Minor. They came in from all hey, North Africa. These people traveled all over the place to come in there. I often wonder about the Ethiopian eunuch. Now it doesn't tell what time of the year. But he came to Jerusalem for to what? Worship. Ah, I believe it was probably one of these feast days that he came in and he was on his way across the Gaza Strip going home again because he had a 1,500 mile one way trip to make by chariot. That's 3,000 miles that that man traveled and he was a Jewish proselyte. So we find here that three times a year they had to appear before the Lord God. Now, verse number 18, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. We went back to that. You go back to the first sacrifice, which was the Paschal lamb on the 14th day of the month. When they were getting ready to come out, they slew that lamb. They put it up. They watched it for days to make sure it was a good lamb, perfect lamb. Then they slew that lamb, took the blood, put it on the doorpost and the lintel over the top of the door. But they did not have any leaven at all in their houses. Leaven in the Bible is a type of sin. You remember when the Lord told his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees? He talked about leaven, and they said it's because we've taken no bread. Uh, they, they, had, they had a mind. They hadn't had anything to eat. and They, they thought he's talking about they didn't have any bread to eat. No, he went back and clarified it. He's talking about the leaven of sin. That's why the Bible said a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's why churches, you've got to keep sin out of the church. If it gets in the church, friend, it'll spread. You take sin in your own personal life. If it gets into your life and you don't get it out, it'll spread. Leaven, a little leaven. You remember how you ladies have made homemade bread? I love that stuff. My mother used to make it all the time, put it in pans and put a dishcloth over the top. It'd be sitting around in the kitchen rising, boy. I mean, that stuff was so good. She'd put that little leaven in, mix it up. Just, uh, you know, we, we buy it down here, dry yeast. Uh, you can buy it down here at Walmart. Matter of fact, we put it in our septic tank about every month or two. We put it in there. It keeps the bacteria active. Uh, in your septic tank. So if you want to keep from having septic tank problems, just get them. They come in three, three little packs together. Just cut it up, put it in the commode, flush it down, and you'll be surprised how well your septic tank go. But anyway, he's he giving instructions here 
about offering the blood. Why? That blood is a type of a different type. This was the blood of animals. But when you get to 1 Peter chapter number 1, the Bible said, For you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. And he talks about the vain tradition, you fathers and all these things. But he said, But with the precious blood of Christ, that, that blood was not tainted with sin. Go to the book of Acts, it calls it the blood of God. I don't understand all I know. I just take the Bible verbatim. God, Christ's blood was not like yours and ours because His was eternal blood. That blood's still on that mercy seat. But He said when you come, you've got to come through an unleavened sacrifice, an unleavened offering. Now, we do not live in perfection in our days. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God just like you are. So what happens is we come through Jesus Christ. That's why I said once again, when you come to God, you better pray in Jesus' name or you, your prayer is not going to get any higher than the ceiling. Because in our flesh, we have no right to appear before God without that eternal offering having been made. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. What did they do? They burnt that fat. They burnt it before God. That, that was the offering that they brought. They burnt the fat and then they brought the blood. Boy, the fat, fat is so important. Now, a lot of people go on fat-free diets. It's, it's not a wise thing to do. Some people go on a carb-free diet. That's not a wise thing to do. You can lose some weight. But your body, needs, your body needs fat. It needs. You say, well, I don't like fat. Well, just cook the fat up in, in and, and get the juice off of it. And you're going to get fat. Uh, you go up in Alaska and up in northern Canada and these places, fat is essential to the diet of these people because they don't have vegetables like we've got. You've got to have fat. I like my steak trimmed with fat. Now, I like it a little crisp. But that bite of that fat, if it's cooked right with that meat, is heaven on earth. That's where you get your taste. I do a lot of seasoning. I like to eat uh, hog jaw. I like to eat uh, bacon and all these things. I remember my mother, she kept a little gold tin <coughs> cup about that big around and about that tall. And it sat right up in the middle of the stove. She's always pouring her grease off. Pouring it in while she was cooking, that spoon was operating in there, getting that uh, hardened grease out, boy, and putting it in your beans and putting it in your potatoes and putting it all there. It's essential, but it's essential to worship. Why? Because that fat is one of the most important parts of that meat. It's just simply talking about the first fruits. Look at verse number 19. And the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Notice he didn't say the first fruits. He said the first of the first fruits. That means before anything else. The first fruit is the first of what you get. But the first of that first fruit, before you ever sink your teeth into what you, that belongs to God. That's an offering to give to God. That's what he's talking about. We go to the tithe and the tithe is right. But he's talking about that the first fruit belongs to God. When you get your billfold right with God, God gets right with your billfold. You hear what I said? I think everybody in here knows that precept. If you're not tithing, you're a foolish individual, son. Because God collects his tithes. He just gets it in different ways. Uh, I found out a long time ago you can live much better on 90% of your income than you can 100% of your income if you're a child of God. So he's just talking about why. It belongs to God. Malachi dealt with that, so I'm not going to deal with it any farther. But he just simply said the first of these first fruits. Now he's going back to the feast of ingathering, which is at the end of the year, that you've gathered the labors out of your field. They brought those to God. They just gave them to God. Now, there's an interesting statement before we get into... Verse number 20 is a change. Uh, there's a little bit of change there. 
you look at the last part of verse 19, there is a, a, a sentence there that's found only three times in your Bible and never with any explanation. There's no explanation for it. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. That's found here, Exodus chapter 34, and then uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 14, I believe is the third time. And it's the exact phrase, thou shalt not seethe. What's he talking about? You don't take a, a kid, a lamb, and boil it. That's what he's talking about, seething it. People say, I'm, I'm seething. You ever heard them say that? They're, they're saying, I'm boiling, son, I'm mad. I mean, I've done brought that thing to a peak is what it is. So it means to bring it to a ball or to a peak. He said you're not to seethe a kid in his mother's milk. In other words, you take the lamb and you kill the lamb and then you take that meat and you take the milk of that mother and put it in a pan and you boil that, uh, that little lamb or that kid until it's done in its mother's milk. There is no explanation given. You can check every commentary that you've got in the world. There's no explanation given. Now, there one, I'm going to give you something that uh, tradition says, and you find this in the writings of the people that lived in those times, that said that the heathens of Canaan would take a lamb and see that in its mother's milk, and then they would take that and sprinkle that, on the trees and the fields and everything. They thought it's something magical that was going to make them really produce good. They say it was a heathen thing. Now, you can take that with a grain of salt. I'm going to give you my take on it, and then you can take it home with you, okay? I think it speaks of with cruelty. That's just me personally. Why would God three times make that? Thou shalt not. Hey, that's an absolute negative. Don't you take that little lamb, kill that lamb, take the milk of its own mother and cook it in its mother's milk. Hey, that mother's milk is to give life, not death. And I thought about, we're getting into offerings and we're getting into a lot of things here, but you know, sometimes you can... Uh, do something right the wrong way. And I thought about cruelty. Uh, it's an act of cruelty to do that, all right? It's, it's a slam on that mother, on that milk, on that lamb, and everything else. Now, this is just my take. It, it's, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot more. But I want to say, when he's talking about when you're bringing these sacrifices and things, hey, they're going to be cooking this meat. Don't you take that little lamb and cook it in his mama's milk. You find another way, there's a lot of ways. You can boil it in water and it'll do right well and put stuff with it. Don't seethe it in its mother's milk. Why? Because these lambs were very special to these people. Boy, the, hey, you're talking about loving. You think you love your animals? Hmm? Some of you here got animals. Some of them got animals in the house. They're like parts of the family. huh? They get more attention than the babies do. Because the babies pay attention to animals before they do mom and dad. They, they're, they're loved in the house. So to take that little lamb. You remember when we dealt with David's sin. Go over to 2 Samuel chapter number 11. But chapter number 12. Old Nathan came and gave him the little scenario about uh, a family that had a little lamb that lived in the house with them. And the kids all played with the lamb and loved that lamb. This old guy that owned that place had thousands and thousands of lambs. And when a stranger came, he went and took their lamb. That's cruelty. You know, the Bible said, one, we're to give with a cheerful heart. Not with a heart of begrudging. You know, you can make a lot of applications, but I just wanted to send that uh, out. That has no explanation. It's mentioned three times. Exodus chapter number 23, 34, and I think Deuteronomy 14. The exact phrase is used, and God said nothing else. But I want you to understand. You say, well, why would God do that? Because this wasn't written to us. The Jews understood what he said. There's things in Revelation that you and I can only speculate about, folks. Because we're not there. 
those people that are in the middle of the tribulation period time will understand perfectly what 666 means. That will be something that the whole world will understand. They'll know. We, we talk about shots. Oh, they're going to be mark of the beast. Now, no, folks. Mark of the beast is not in our time. It'll be toward the end of the tribulation period. But they will know. These Jews knew what God said. We don't normally do that anyway. That's not a part of our lifestyle. Now, I want to get down to verse number 20 to introduce it. Now, he said, now, behold. He's, he's, what, what's he doing with behold? He's changing the direction of your eyes. A good pitcher in baseball never throws a ball high or low three or four times in if you know anything about baseball, I used to do some pitching. I used to do a lot of things. What you have to do is you have to change the direction of their eyes. It's a deceptive thing. If you throw a ball high and they swing and they get a little piece of that thing, next time, just throw it low and outside. Change the direction. Then you can come high and inside. And what you're doing, they're looking down here for the ball. It's up here. They're looking up here for the ball and it's down there. You're changing the direction of their eye. God uses the word behold in the same type of, of, of... What He's doing is you're looking here and He said behold. All right? So we find a change in where He's going. Now He's going to talk about not... not the law, hey, we're through with the moral law, we're through with the civil law, we're through with the feast days here. Now we're going toward Canaan's land. What's he doing? He's setting them up to go into the promised land. He's going to set up the tabernacle. He's going to set up the priesthood. He's going to set up the hierarchy, all right? Up, it's, it's a theocracy with God. God's the one in control and then he's put Moses and then Aaron and he's, he's got these men lined up down through here. Behold, I send an angel before thee. Anybody see anything different about that word angel? Capital. You see that? Not a angel, but an angel with a capital. This is important. If you look down, I want you to notice in verse number 22, he, he uses the God. This is God. This is Jehovah speaking, right? In verse number 22, I notice that he said, Obey his voice, then I will be an enemy and an adversary, I will cut them off in verse 23 at the last part. He swaps back and forth from the angel to being him. Him is a uh, third person, singular. He's not talking to him. He's talking about him. You've got in English first person, second person, and third person. First person, I, me, my, we, you're talking about yourself in at least inclusive. And then second person is you. He's talking to somebody directly. Third person, we're talking about somebody not here. That's usually what Baptists use. Okay. They talk about, somebody said, what do you talk about? I, we usually talk about the one don't show up. All right. Now, I want you to notice the capital A. Why? This, there's three things and then we're going to close with this. God's still going to go before him. Now he's in a pillar of cloud in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night. But they're setting up a tabernacle and now he's going to deal with them directly over the top of that tabernacle. But he's still going to be leading. Because when that cloud picks up and everything, they pack that tabernacle up, they follow. So they're going to follow him in. But what he's doing is he's, he's letting them know that I am going to go before you. If you went to the book of Joshua the first uh, city that they attacked when they came across the Jordan River at flood stage and the water stood up in a heap. When they got over there, the first city they attacked was a place called Jericho. Jericho, because it was right there where you crossed that river, was one of the most fortified, powerful cities in Canaan. These walls, friend, they couldn't be breached. I'm talking about if it was going to take a miracle for an army to do anything with these people. 
And as they sat there in front of that city for the first time, the spies had seen it. You, you remember when the spies said it's walled up to heaven? <laughs> Friend, when they saw that massive fortress of a city, I mean, their hearts absolutely fainted, son. I, Joshua was a man of war. They were set. I can see all the generals sitting around saying, now what are we going to do with the first one? <laughs> I, and that's just the first one. This thing, hey, we'll, we'll lose half of our army by attacking those walls. When you attack those walls, but that high ground, son, is imperative in military strat strategy. It's just imperative that you have that. All of a sudden, Joshua sees a man standing with a sword. That man was the captain of the Lord's host. You say, who was that? You have three things that I'm just going to mention, and then we'll go back to them this next week, Lord willing. God appeared in three different ways to His people. One in what's called a theophany. A theophany... Theos means God. Often he just simply means an epiphany. I've seen something. Uh, so what happens is God representing just God in general. Okay. The second thing you have is what's called a Christophany. A Christophany is the angel of the Lord. In this particular instance, this is the angel of the Lord. It's got a capital A to it. It's not a little A. The angel of the Lord is always capitalized. So what you find is a Christophany. This is actually almighty Jehovah God. That's why he changes his to a personal singular pronoun. He said, you follow him and I'll do. I'm going to do this. Why? He's, he's the one going before you. Aren't you glad God goes before you? So he's going to go before them into the land. Then the second, the third is that great big old long word, anthropomorphism. You can look that up if you want to. It just simply means a representation of God in an inanimate form. This is an anthropomorphism. You didn't know that, did you? Why? Because we find almighty God in His fullness right here in this book I hold in my hand, this King James Bible. You want to know about God? There He is. You want to know how He thinks? There it is. You want to know how He leads? There it is. You want, hey, hey, answers to every question you've got, you've got here pertaining to life. He said, He's given us all things dealing with life and spiritual things. He gives them to us. This is an anthropomorphism. Why? In the beginning was the what? Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We find the Word in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. You go to Revelation chapter 19 when He's coming back. We're getting ready to start dealing with that. We're finishing up with chapter 18. He hath a name written. What is that name? The Word of God. This is anthropomorphism right here. This is a representation of deity in an inanimate form. This has no life, and yet it is life. The rock of Horeb, and that rock that followed them was Christ. A rock of flint that a rock actually followed these people through the desert giving out water. Huh? This is anthropomorphism, amen. a great big old tongue-twisting name. But we're finding that you're going to have a Christophany. That angel that God sends, that messenger, that angel of the Lord is going to be almighty Jehovah God leading them in the battle when they come into that land. And that's why he said, oh, you don't have to fight with them. He said, all you got to do is just march around them 13 times in, se in, in seven days. 13 times. That's all. That's all. You, just, you just walk around, you blow the horns and watch them great big old walls that you're fearing. You watch them fall flat. They're going to hit the ground in front of your eyes and then you can just walk right on in. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the day. Pray, Father, you'd bless the service to come. Give us a good day today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.
Going to be dismissed to the Sunday school classes. Amen. I mean to the prayer rooms. I'm sorry. <laughs> dismissed to the prayer rooms. You might bring a locket to Yeah. I got a purple shirt on with the white.